So if, I don't know if you, do you want me to introduce you? Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I can introduce myself. I'm going to share my screen first. Perfect. Okay. So can everyone see a picture up there? Yep. Okay. Um, first thing I want to do is thank Sarah for inviting me. Um, what she does with New Mexico Wildlife Federation and Nature Ninos is absolutely fantastic. And I love giving these talks. And quite frankly, I was quite honored when she asked me if I would talk about my career in uh, conversation, conservation um, because it is one of the top 10 coolest jobs. And I absolutely was thrilled to do that and to, to talk to folks, whether or not it's a, a 10 year old kid or a 80 year old person that's just loving wildlife. Um, that's what I do, that's one of my passions. So one of the things I wanted to do today um, for this presentation is literally talk about those, some of those really cool uh, conservation jobs. And what I'm gonna focus on today is my job as a wildlife biologist. And so my name is Daryl Radijak. I've been a career wildlife biologist for going on 30 years now. Have no intention of retiring anytime soon simply because I absolutely love what I do. And so um, what I wanna do today is kind of just tell you about how I got into this job and kind of some of the things I do because I know there's a ton of people out there that are struggling to find out what they wanna do with their life. And my 20 year old son is one of them. He's, he's at that age trying to figure out what career he's gonna go into. Um, he doesn't like wildlife biology, but for those that absolutely love the outdoors, love nature, love wildlife, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story and hopefully it will resonate with you. And if it doesn't, that's great. That's the, because it'll help you figure out, you know what, maybe that's not what I wanna do. And so positive, negative, all of those are learning experiences to help you figure out what you want to do. So let me give you a real little bit of background about me and how I came to this position I have now. And so when I was young, growing up, I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, my dad worked in General Mills cereal factory and he worked hard. He worked uh, 50, 60 hours a week just to raise a family, raise the kids. Now this is a picture of me and my son, but when I was that little boy's age, my dad was taking me camping, hunting, fishing. Uh, whenever he'd get vacation days, he would take us out somewhere in nature. And those were the best weeks of any given year because we would be, we'd be camping, we'd see deer, I'd go hunting with them. And so at a really young age, I was one of those fortunate people that, that knew what they wanted to do uh, right from the get-go. And so I told my dad, I love you, dad, but I'm not going to follow in your footsteps because I want to live your vacation. And one of the, one of the defining moments in my life, and th this is funny because many of you growing up will remember something that really impacted you. And so I'm, sh I'm hoping most of you know what kind of bird this is. We don't really have these in New Mexico, but uh, since I was up near the Canadian border, when we would go camping, we would occasionally see birds like this. And this is a snowy owl. And I was, I remember I was about 10, 12 years old and I had ridden my bike to this pond in Allegheny State Park. And I just sat there and I was just watching things. And I saw this bird fly in and land on a snag not far from me. And I was in awe. I was the only one there is like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? And so the bird was really close to me and it was just one of those really cool things. And again, I was only 10, 12 years old. And then what struck me the most, and I still remember it to that, to this day, is that bird flew away and I remember, I can't hear it. It's not making a sound. I, it, it just blew my mind because I could always picture uh, pigeons or, or crows or birds flapping their wings and I would hear the sound, yet this bird was completely silent. And I just sat there as a little boy saying, what the heck did I just see? What, what is going on there? Why, why can't I hear this bird? And so I knew, like I said, at a really young age exactly what I wanted to do. And so from that point forward, it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
get a job. I'm going to work with wildlife. I'm going to work with animals because these things are just so gosh darn cool. So where most kids were watching Scooby-Doo and Bugs Bunny and all that, I would watch those too, but I'd also be watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins. Uh, one of my biggest favorites was, um, and now, it's, now I'm drawing a blank here, Marty Stauffer's Wild America, uh, because I was really infatuated with North American wildlife. I really didn't dream of going to Africa or some exotic place. There was enough in my own backyard I didn't know. So that was one of those defining moments where it's like, man, I know, I know what I want to do. This is pretty awesome. So here's a lesson to the story or a moral to the story. You have to pursue your dreams and go to school to learn as much as you can about your passions. And for me, it was wildlife. I knew right then and there what I was going to do, where I was going to go. Um, and I pulled this, it's not a great picture, but I just want to show you, it's a college campus. It doesn't have to be a specific college. Some people will brag about their schools better than another school. It doesn't matter what you have to do. You have to pursue, uh, an education in your passion. And so I ended up going to one of the best schools in that neck of the woods. Um, it was the state university of New York college of environmental science and forestry. It was a fantastic college for, for wildlife. It was a fantastic college for forestry and it was right up my alley. And so I studied hard. I've worked during the summers, paid for uh, school myself and I earned that degree. And so the cool thing when you're studying, you, you then have to start selecting your career path. Like what, what field am I really interested in? And when it comes to wildlife studies, uh, there, there's a couple of different directions you could go. There's literally hundreds of different directions you could go, but two of the primary directions was more or less uh, focusing on studying animals or individual animals or specific species, or you can look at the whole thing and literally study habitats, where those animals live. And those two fields, like I said, you can go in so many different directions in both of those fields. Um, and so we have a lot of people that are animal or population biologists. We also have a lot of people that are habitat biologists. They're both equally important, both wonderful jobs. But I stuck with my passion. I really love the wildlife side of things. And so I really uh, wanted to go in that direction. So I got my degree in wildlife management. And one of the things as soon as you get a degree, there's, there's something about that piece of paper that people will say, oh, I have a degree. Now I'm going to get a job and make tons of money and be happy and live happily ever after. So what do you think my first job was after getting my degree? It had absolutely nothing to do with wildlife. One of the problems it is in these conservation careers lots of people want them. They're, they're, they're really awesome, awesome jobs. And so as soon as I graduated, this was back in 1992, my first job, I was doing medical research. I, I had bills to pay. And so I took this job and I was working in a lab. And I actually worked here a number of years. And guess what, guys, I was hating life. Th this isn't what I wanted to do. And so I was going in every day, still dreaming about in the back of my mind, man, I would love to work with wildlife and, and just do, do those things that I enjoyed as, as a kid. And when you're working in a job that you really don't care for, your heart's not in it, you probably don't perform as well as you should. So it's so critically important to, to really focus and try to get a position that you absolutely love. And so as I was stuck in this, this lab, laboratory job, this job that I didn't really care for, it was, it was earning pretty good money, but I didn't like what I was doing. I decided to make a change. Mm -hmm. And so what I decided to do is like, I've got to earn a position in wildlife. And so although I have my education, I have a background, I have a piece of paper that says I've studied this, I had no experience. And so what I started doing was volunteering with 
the uh, New York Department of Environmental Conservation. So they're the equivalent of the New Mexico Department of Fish and Game. And so here I was, early 20s, uh, my weekends, any time I had time off, I would call the Department of Conservation and say, hey, is there anything that I can do to help you guys out? Not wanting to get paid, I just need experience. And so they're, they're like, heck yeah, we got stuff. And so they would send me sitting in swamps doing frog or amphibian studies where I would have to learn my frog calls and then document what types of frogs are in different locations. And so I was sitting in swamps uh, swatting mosquitoes, but I was getting experience in wildlife. Uh, they also had me doing uh, rough grouse studies. And so in the winter time, I would hike all these different trails wherever they would send me looking for tracks of ruffed grouse. That's an upland game bird species they have up there. Plenty of them too. And so I would help them with grouse studies. And then one of the studies that uh, I really helped out with because I really, really enjoyed, they would ask me to do these deer studies. Now, a couple of them involved doing deer surveys, but I was also working deer check stations. So I was, I was learning how to age deer. I uh, was getting weights, getting all sorts of measurements. Now, I wasn't doing that work alone. I was working with a biologist, but my time with them, it was probably one of the best invested times I ever had simply because it was getting me experience in something that I really, really wanted to do. And so I did that for, for a number of years, just getting a little bit of experience doing this kind of survey, working with this kind of animal. And all the while, I'm adding stuff to my resume. I, I get to, to tell people, oh yeah, I did this type of study with this kind of animal. And I was just adding it, albeit it wasn't a really strong resume. The more and more volunteer experience I listed, the better it made my resume look. And I will tell you first and foremost, from someone who has hired biologists, I will look for those people that have a lot of volunteer experience simply because it shows the passion and it shows the drive for someone wanting to get in that field. So shortly after I started volunteering and really getting my resume up to where it needs to be, where I can actually get a paying job in wildlife, I was finally offered my first wildlife job. And this was down in Tennessee, East Tennessee to be exact just outside of Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I saw an ad, but way back then, they actually had ads in newspapers, uh, but they were looking for someone to manage this place called the Appalachian Bear Center. And so I'm like, that sounds like something that would be really interesting. So I had applied for it. And I was one of the few people that applied that actually had a college degree in wildlife. And I had all this volunteer experience so they actually flew me down to interview. And so I interviewed for this position and lo and behold, they hired me. Now, don't get me wrong, this was not a high paying job. In fact, when I arrived on site, this is where they said, welcome home. This is where you're gonna live. This is what your first job is. And this is what it looked like. This is just outside Great Smoky Mountain National Park. It was down a mile or two long, uh, gravel road, middle of nowhere, and there was these buildings on site. The building to the left was a little single wide trailer, and that and it had a shed. And they said, "Welcome home. This is where you're going to live, and work begin working with bears." And what my work with bears involved was the National Park Service, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, as well as the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. They would bring me orphaned or injured bear cubs to be rehabilitated so they could be returned back to the wild. Because back then in the early 1990s or late 1990s, the bear population was still kind of struggling in that area. And so every bear counted. And what they did at this location where they hired me as a brand new facility, uh, they had these bear pens. It, actually, if you look to the right of this photo in those pine trees, there was a trail that led down the hill to these bear pens that we would get in these injured or orphaned cubs 
and we had put them in there, we would feed them, we would take care of them until they were big enough to be released back into the wild. It's like, how cool is that? That's my first wildlife job. And so it wasn't long before the National Park Service, this is Rick Varner, he, he brought this bear from the National Park that had fallen out of a tree and had a severe injury to its back legs. Uh, they, they did some uh, veterinary work on the bear, but it needed time to rehabilitate and recuperate. And so I put it down in the bear pens, took care of it. Again, we make sure that the bear doesn't get used to being fed by people. So everything was done behind blinds. And then once the bear gets old enough and, and big enough and healthy enough to be returned back to the wild, put a radio collar on it, take it back to where we found it and let it go. And then we track its movements. Another cool thing is not all the bears were really big bears. In fact, we got some bears uh, from North Carolina that were neonatals. Um, a logging company cut down a tree, did not realize that there was a mother bear hibernating in that tree, and she abandoned her brand newborn cubs. And so they sent these bears to me to take care of, and you talk about being a nervous papa. <laughs> I had no idea how to take care of these bears, but I had so much help from the wildlife agencies, the Park Service, the University of Tennessee. They told me what I needed to do, and what we do with these is simply take care of them long enough until we could find a female bear in the wild that would raise these cubs. And so once we found that female bear in the wild, uh, we would hike to her den. Once we got to her den, we would um, pull her out. We would pull out her natural cubs. We'd take all these measurements. All the while, I am living the dream. I'm working with bears. I'm learning more about animals and what they're requirements are, especially for wild animals that sometimes we don't know much about. And then when we're all done, we leave one of those orphan cubs with the mama bear in the wild and we let her raise her. So talk about me getting lucky and I will be the first to admit I was totally lucky to get that job. Um, but when you're working with black bears, taking care of them, working with the National Park Service, releasing these bears, tracking them, it was absolutely amazing. And I did that for about five years. And so that is where that volunteer experience really, really paid off for me getting my foot in the door. And I can't tell you how important it is to get the foot in the door. So you get to network with people. You get to meet people and, and uh, uh, list them on resumes as, as people that you can reference for a good word on you. And so after I did this, I finally made the jump to work for a state wildlife agency. And back then I was living in Tennessee. And so working for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, which again is equivalent of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. I got hired on there uh, in my late twenties. So sometimes it takes a long time before you get that, that really good foot in the door. But I got hired on there and before long, what my main job was as a wildlife biologist was counting animals because we manage native animals. Um, we also try to manage non-native animals in a completely different way. But what we're trying to do is figure out if the population is going up, staying the same or going down. Because if, if we're counting animals and we know the population's going down, we're gonna have to adjust some of our management. And so the cool thing was um, one of my primary responsibilities, I was, I was promoted quickly to the big game program coordinator. And so my job was literally counting the big, cool megafauna, those, those animals that we all know and love. So I was the deer coordinator for the state. I was also the elk coordinator. Now you might think, you're in Tennessee, you don't have elk. Well, believe it or not, when I was there, we started our elk program and we were just releasing animals, returning animals back to the state of Tennessee. They were killed out uh, over a hundred years prior. And so we we're trying to restore elk populations in Tennessee. And so that was one of the coolest things I did. Um, Another thing I was, I was the bear coordinator. I had bear experience, so this was a perfect fit. But instead of me working with individual animals, I'm now working with populations of animals. And trying to count bears is really, really hard because they're very secretive and there's not many of them. 
And so I would work on these, these surveys that were called bait station surveys in which you're trying to find out how many, how many bears are visiting all these bait sites. And when you keep track of it year after year after year, you can see population trends. And so that was my job. Um, another animal that I was in charge of was, was wild hogs. So you look at these four animals, four, three of them are near and dear to our hearts. This last one though, is what we call a non-native. So believe it or not, we manage non-natives and the way we manage this particular species is we wanted to get rid of it because they weren't supposed to be in Tennessee. It's easier said than done, uh, but these were, were definitely some of um, the, the greatest job responsibilities I had was counting animals. Now, I don't know if I'll have time, probably won't because I, I ramble too much, but I have a video that I can show you real, real quickly about how we counted deer and elk. And it was, I did that for years and years and it was one of the most interesting things. So after I did that, after I was the big game program coordinator, um, I don't know why, but the director of the agency saw something in me and he promoted me to chief of wildlife. And so instead of working with those big game animals only, I was then working with pretty much every animal we found in the state. Now we had a whole cadre of superb wildlife biologists that would specialize in individual animals. But for the most part, in many, many situations, it involved trying to estimate how many animals we, we, were, we had of each species. So we can then determine if they were doing well, if they were staying the same, or if they were in decline, because then we'd have to do something about it. So I think that is the end of my slides. The, the moral of the story here, guys, is you can do anything you wanna do. You have to put your heart and your mind to it. And I will tell you, first and foremost, it will be difficult. When you're volunteering and not getting paid, sometimes you're like, this is for the birds. I could go work at, at such and such place and make a whole lot more money, absolutely. But like I said, there is no greater reward than working in something you love because you wake up every day wanting to do that. And I promise you guys, you'll feel like you have never worked a day in your life. And so I'm truly blessed, but being a wildlife biologist and working with these wild critters has been an absolutely amazing thing. And I'm so fortunate. And if you guys have any questions um, I can take those. I don't know, Sarah, you'll be my guide whether or not I could show that quick video or not. Um, how long is it? Well, I could just show like 30 seconds. I just wanted to show you the, let's yeah. see if I can. All right, let me um, call this up. Oops. Hold on, let me pause it. <laughs> I put it on the wrong screen. Um, can you see that where it says big bucks in the dark? Yes. To be okay. used solely for wildlife studies. And it's an exciting new territory. Just to give you an idea, we, I pioneered this new method of surveying deer and elk. And what we were using was thermal imaging equipment from, uh, that we would use from the vehicle. Tennessee is much different than the West where we don't have a lot of wide open spaces. And so we had used those thermal imaging cameras that detect body heat to help us with our population surveys for deer and elk. And th these are just some of the videos from it. ...that we're real interested in, in testing out. And we've been doing some pilot studies over the last year. And in particular, we're looking at white-tailed deer. And we're trying to find out some things that we don't know about our current deer herd. And the thermal imager allows us to take a peek at the deer herd and let us know. Tell me that's not the coolest thing in the world, being able to, to drive around in the middle of the night and see these animals that no one else sees because a, a lot of these wildlife are nocturnal. Um, so you might get a, a glimpse of them uh, right before dark or early morning, um, but a lot of them are most active kind of throughout the night. And so this camera allowed us to see things that the average person couldn't see. So it was, it was truly spectacular. So how am I doing on time? We okay? I can take some questions. Yeah, some questions, definitely. If anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to put them in the chat and I can read them out. 
or you can physically raise your hand and ask the question, whatever works best for you. Do you have any questions for Daryl? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, hold on, I can't unmute you. Though. There you go. Yeah. Um, so what is your favorite species to collect data on and just observe in the wild? Excellent question, Michaela. Um, I fell in love with bears. And it was probably because that first job I had, I was working closely with black bears. And so I had that background. And the one thing that I found out is the vast majority of the public really <laughs> They, they need a lot of education because they don't know how to behave around bears or act around bears. And, and so that was one of my favorite animals to work with. But having said that, I do like those large carnivores. So after moving to New Mexico, obviously we have black bears in New Mexico, but one thing that we have here that I didn't have back in Tennessee was cougars. And so I actually, here I am, I'm 50 years old. I'm still volunteering. So I was volunteering with the National Park Service up in the Valles Caldera to help them with some cougar studies. And we were tracking some cougars up in the Jemez Mountains. And so it's, it's one of those things where when it's your passion, you'll do it your whole life and you don't have to get paid for it. It is really, really nice to get paid for it. But I can't tell you how many times I would be doing a bear study or doing a cougar study and I'd be hiking up in the mountains and saying, I cannot believe I get paid to do this. And so that's why I can't stress enough how important it is to pursue your passion. Um, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be wildlife. If it's computers, if it's mathematics, engineering, being a doctor, just make sure you really follow in what your heart is telling you you like to do. But I would say the large carnivores, in particular bears, are about my favorite animal. Daryl, you have one more question. Have you done work with raptors? And that's from Max. Um, I haven't done any physical, well, I, I shouldn't say I haven't done any. Um, I didn't specialize in studying raptors, but having said that, because of where I worked and because of all the people I knew, I helped with a golden eagle study in Tennessee where we we're putting transmitters on golden eagles to find out where they migrate to and it was crazy because we were capturing these birds in Tennessee and they were going to um, I forget the bay in northern Canada uh, but they would go all the way up to that arctic circle area spend the summer and then come all the way back down to Tennessee. Now I do know I, I tried to pride myself in being a, a pretty good generalist and that I could speak uh, relatively um, trying to think of the word. I'm educated enough that I think I could, uh, I'm above the average person when it comes to most wildlife. And so what I do is I teach these classes, really basic classes for people that love wildlife, but they don't know much about wildlife. And so I've, I've taught raptor classes, birds of prey, just to go through the different kinds of birds of prey, what they eat, uh, what they do throughout the day, uh, how they hatch their young. And so, uh, yes, I've done some things with raptors, but that's not my focus within my, within my current job. All right, Daryl, I think we have time for one more question. It looks like Cole has a question. Oh, hold on, there you go. I started working with your wildlife job. Did you know you were gonna work with bear, bears or like, were you nervous? Like the first, uh, um, I wanted because like, you didn't know, like, because you said you didn't know. Mark, yes, did you... uh, awesome question, Cole. At that point in my career, I knew I loved wildlife, but as the first job, I was willing to work with anything. I, I just wanted to work with wildlife, and I was fortunate that the first job actually involved working with black bears. But I'll let you in on a little secret. The first time I drove down to Tennessee to take that job. I went to, to Gatlinburg because Gatlinburg was known for having, having lots of bears come into town. Um, and so I, I drove down there and when I witnessed my first bear, before I ever worked with any of them, I'll tell you, my, my knees were kind of shaking. And I'm like, what did I get myself into? 
but the more you work with these animals, the, the, the more you, you learn to appreciate them, the, the more you can understand them. Um, but I have a feeling it, it would have been the same way if I started working with frogs or waterfowl or, or, or whatever wildlife was my first opportunity. And, and you'll find you will absolutely learn to love what you're doing with wildlife, especially when you know you're making a difference. You're truly helping that animal out. So I would say experiment with, with anything, whatever opportunities you have, and then it'll click. You'll know deep down, man, this is what I, I truly love to do. But at that point in time, I would have worked with anything. Right. I think we're going to wrap it up. Daryl, thank you so very much for coming and sharing. It's always amazing hearing you speak. It motivates me to <laughs> learn more and do more in the field too. So I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your day. No and problem. I'm going to sit go back ahead. and watch now. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right, cool. So our next speaker is Mr. Eric Griffin. Eric, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself. That way you can, I'm sure you can do it better than I can. Tell us what you do. Sure. Well, uh, first, first off, I wanted to thank Sarah as well. Um, it's it's quite an honor to be to be asked to do something like this, and I'm more than happy to. I'm not sure if I have one of the ten coolest jobs. I think I do, but I am very biased. Uh, but I very much appreciate the invite, and more than happy to do this. Um, Daryl, I would say thank you so much for for your talk. Uh, it was. Great and I actually grew up in the, in the North Georgia mountains, very close to the Great Smoky Mountains, which is one of the most beautiful places I think in the country. Um, I will say I saw that WVU pick, and man, I'm University of Pittsburgh all the way, so I got to disagree with you on that. Uh, but I'm actually going to share my screen as well. Um, I do not have the ability to share screen. Is it? Could I get permission? You should now. Okay. Great. Okay. Can everyone see this PowerPoint? Yep. You're good. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so I uh, have just organized a few slides, hopefully with some cool pictures and videos that, that everyone will enjoy. Uh, hopefully you guys have some good questions. So I am actually an assistant professor at the New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico, up in the northern part of the state. I'm actually concurrently um, also a research associate with the Smithsonian Institution. That is where I, I came from, from Washington, D.C. and moved out here, but I currently hold both of those positions. So I'm going to try to focus a little more on the teaching, but the research and teaching are uh, a little integrated with one another, so you'll, you'll hear a little bit about both. So just a little bit about my background. So I grew up in, uh, as I said, in North Georgia, uh, went to a public high school called Central Gwinnett uh, Lawrenceville High School. And, um, and my, my love of biology and, and particularly plant biology started very early with a couple of great teachers that I had in high school. And so I think my, my love for science really came in early. And I was uh, worked very hard to to pursue a, a career in science from from a very early age. From there, I actually went to a small college. I, I definitely agree with Daryl's sentiment of you don't have to go to an Ivy League college. You don't have to go to uh, these huge kind of institutions. I went to a very small liberal arts school in Georgia. Uh, called Berry College. It only has about 2,000 students. As you can see, a very beautiful school. But there, I was able to pursue a lot of these opportunities in research and, and, and outdoor kind of experiences. First, I worked with uh, the Coyote, the, with Project Coyote. Um, the college actually has uh, its claim to fame is that it has the largest campus in the world. It has about 30,000 acres of naturally preserved land. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to, to attend that college because I was interested in, um, in the outdoors and research and plants and animals. And so 
Uh, I, I did some research with a professor there on um, with the Project Coyote. Um, the, uh, the site to that is projectcoyote.org. Um, and, and that was one of the coolest experiences that, that I had as an undergraduate student. I also did a lot of research on pine trees, on longleaf pine trees, where we did some prescribed burnings, where we did some restoration efforts and um, with another professor on campus. So I think that my, my advice to a lot of you is really just discover what, as Daryl was saying, discover what your passions are and then really just pursue them. Um, and, and I think just asking and saying yes is always a good, is always a good piece of advice. If, if a professor or a teacher or, or someone says, well, here, this may be an, a good opportunity if you're interested, it, it's a great thing to say yes. And the, the, there may be some um, anxieties and, and, and some nerves involved with that. But it's really these types of experiences that uh, that help really form what you would like to do in your career. So after after I went to college, um, I actually worked as an environmental educator at the 4-H Center in Georgia. And there's a short, I think, two minute video that I tested this. I hope that it works. Um, let's see. Let me know if you guys can see that video in here. Okay. Six facilities. Over a million participants impacted. Infinite memories. Well, we came 40 years ago, so we're a 40-year school. And from the beginning, our guiding idea was that students can learn outside of the classroom, sometimes better than they can learn in the classroom. It connects them with the learning in such a positive, strong way that we decided after the first year we were coming forever. Whether you're a first-time school or a 40-year school, we thank you. Thank you for allowing us to provide life-changing experiences for your students. This experience is just transformative for them. They come here thinking one thing about themselves and leave a completely different person. We've gotten to see students who have never been to the beach. I was at the beach yesterday with a student who said, Miss Bennett, this is my first time on the beach. They do things by themselves for the first time. They take this emotional and educational leap and they become more mature. And seeing a kid triumph out in the woods of Rock Eagle, that's the best memory for me. In the Georgia 4-H Environmental Education Program, we are proud to complement school standards, bring learning to life, strengthen relationships among youth and adults, build connections to nature, and provide unparalleled experiences in the ultimate classroom without walls. You know, this is uh, second to none. I was speaking with the superintendent for my district this morning, and I said that this has probably been one of the greatest experiences I've had as a principal, uh, and I would make sure that this continues to happen, but not only just with our fifth grade, seeing how we can do this possibly with fourth grade and lower grade levels as well, because I want everyone to be able to have this kind of experience. The possibilities for your students are endless. Join us as we serve for another 40 years and reach another million. So I'll stop that right there. But um, so after college, I was an environmental educator for K through 12 groups at this 4-H center in Georgia, which was such a great experience and really instilled in me the desire to be able to, to be outdoors, but also to teach students. Um, and so after that, I knew I, I knew I had to go to graduate school to do this. And I will continue the slideshow here. And then I went to the University of Pittsburgh to get my PhD in biology. And there I had the uh, great opportunity to get funded to work down in the tropical rainforest in Latin America, uh, primarily in Panama and in Ecuador. And so I actually lived, here's kind of a snapshot, I actually lived on an island there um, in the Panama Canal for about three years where this is what the, uh, the island looked like. I, I lived at a field station owned by the Smithsonian Institution. 
um, and just did work in the tropical rainforest. It was uh, probably the, the coolest experience I have had in my career. And in addition to that, I actually taught a, a, a slew of course of field-based courses through many different programs, government programs, universities, and that was another major tenet of, of, of my love for, for research and for the outdoors is being able to teach undergraduate students. And here are some just uh, pictures of, of our groups in the field. Um, there, the top left is in at the La Selva Biological Station in Costa Rica. On the top right, we have a picture in Ecuador at a cacao farm of learning how to make chocolate, uh, which was great. Uh, the bottom left, I'm teaching um, a class just uh, literally outside in a tropical rainforest in Ecuador. And then on the bottom right of us in a forest in Panama. So a bunch of very cool experiences. There's a picture of me um, and just in Ecuador. Uh, really saw, as you can imagine, you know, uh, these tropical rainforests are the biodiversity hotspots in the world and saw a bunch of great, we say flora and fauna are plants and animals, essentially. And I have a couple of very cool videos. I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of howler monkeys, but I have a video of, and hopefully you can hear it, of how loud these guys are. But we would, we would hear the howler monkeys, uh, they are active in the morning and at night, so they would wake us up very early and, and their howls can be heard for up to two miles away. And so we, that was our alarm clock every morning. And I actually have another video of, of some of the howler monkeys that were just hanging out outside of the balcony of my, uh, of my room that I was staying in. And you can see, and they actually have a couple of young, one in their chest, I think one is riding on the back of another adult. And they're just eating the leaves off of that tree. And so while just being here, it was uh, a great experience to be able to do research, but also to be able to teach, to teach field courses, to teach young students as well as college students coming in um, to the rainforest. And, and that really you know, instilled that passion for being able to teach and, and also do research at the same time, which is, which is what I'm currently doing. And I would say my, my favorite, um, animal in the world is the three-toed sloth. And I saw one on the last couple of weeks that I was there and I had to show this video. So those guys were really cool to see as well. Uh, but I just have some pictures of other field courses that I've taught. Um, we've done some bird banding up uh, by Lake Erie in Pennsylvania. That's that left picture in a conservation biology course. Um, those top two pictures are field courses that I taught in Wyoming a couple of years ago. Um, you see the birthday hats that all the students have in that middle top picture. It was someone's birthday. We went on a beautiful birthday hike for him. Um, and I even taught a, a class that this was up in Lake Erie, that bottom picture too, where we, where we took out a bunch of boats for the students to look at uh, we, uh, island biogeography or the size of islands and how that has an effect on the species on those islands. And so after all of this, I actually worked at the Smithsonian Institution outside of DC um, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. 
So I did that for about three years working in the forests uh, on a huge tree diversity experiment. And that led me to ultimately um, last year, I was hired as an assistant professor here at New Mexico Highlands University as a professor in biology where I teach ecology and evolution and research methods. And many of those, I try to get the students outside as often as possible because we know that a great, uh, that you guys really enjoy that as students and you actually learn a lot more when you're out in the field and being able to to touch things to see animals to be able to to do your own work and and to roam around and explore so and and just to kind of highlight uh, I, i've taught a whole slew of, of courses um, my favorite are obviously out in the field but have taught some uh, lab based courses as well but I'm, I'm really excited and, and, and privileged and, and happy to have the experiences that I've had in my career. But I think in general, the biggest piece of advice that I have is to really uh, explore and, and to really figure out what you are interested in. And, and then to have, I think another piece of advice is to have great mentors that or older students or older adults that are doing the, the fun things or the, have the fun job that you're interested in and ask them questions and ask for advice and to, um, to try to follow a little bit in their foot, footsteps while also carving out your, your own path. And so that's a, a, a big thing that was always very helpful to me was to find older students and older adults that, um, that that had the kind of job that I was interested in pursuing and then in really get advice and try to follow in their footsteps. So I'm happy to, uh, you know, provide my, my information to you, Sarah, at, that can be distributed to any student who is interested in emailing me at any point. I'm happy to, to help in any way that I can. So, um, so with that, I'm, I'm very happy to, to take any questions that anyone might have. Awesome, thank you, Eric. And again, guys, you can put it in the chat box or I'm gonna flip through and you guys can raise hands. Um, Eric, if you end your screen share, then I can see everybody on the same screen and I can make sure, sure I'm catching everybody that, um, there we go. Okay. If we have any questions. <laughs> Daryl has a question for you. <laughs> no, I actually I don't have a question. My oh. wife was listening in and Eric, she says, you're way cooler than I am. <laughs> Actually, with your black bear work, I got a little green with envy as well. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'm feeling very uncool over here. I'm feeling like I need to go back to school and like learn some more things. <laughs> uh, Max has a question. Go ahead, Max. Babe. Have you ever been to Costa Rica? That's a great question. Yes. So the one picture that I had, I said at the La Selva Biological Station, that was in Costa Rica outside of San Jose. And we taught a, a little mini field course there. And we were able to, to see the forest, obviously, but then the beaches are so close and we went up to a vol an active volcano. So uh, so it's a very cool, very cool place to be at. Is that a place that you guys have been? Oh, very cool. You been? Oh, All right. I'm sure you have a bunch of cool stories and pictures as well. Very cool. Thanks the for the question. Oh, go ahead, Max. The actual reason, the only reason we actually went there is because my mom really likes sloths and we want, and she wanted to go see the sloths. Yeah, did you guys go, there is the sloth sanctuary that was outside of, you guys went there, so you guys did something that I really wanted to do but couldn't, so that's great. That's pretty cool. Thank you for sharing, Max. Mm -hmm. It looks like Michaela has a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Michaela. Um, so I am hoping to study abroad at least one semester when I go to college. Do you have any advice um, for doing that? That's a really great question. I will say that probably was my biggest regret as, as a, a college student was not studying abroad. Uh, a lot of this stuff I had to, to do in graduate school. So 
Um, so uh, with, with my advice there is to really maybe talk to students that have, have studied abroad and ask, um, and, and ask what their experiences were. And depending on uh, what college you're going to attend, they have a lot of partnerships with many of these schools and programs around the world. So you can talk to them about the particular partnerships that they have and in what parts of the world, and then you can pick which one uh, interests you the most. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool, Michaela. Just on the other end of it, and a little bit younger, before I started with this position, I worked for a nonprofit that faced high school exchange students all throughout the country. And, you know, I didn't do it, but I worked with thousands of them. And I can tell you, you'll never regret it, um, whether it be high school or college. I think it adds a whole nother level of experience and um, just it's going to broaden your horizons tremendously wherever you choose to go. So that's really cool. I think another major concern for students is, is, is money, is, is how to fund an experience like that. And feel free anyone else to shoot, in, to shoot in here, but there are always a lot of great scholarship opportunities um, that might be available that can pay a huge chunk of, of, what, uh, of what that trip would cost. So, so don't necessarily let the cost deter you. Make sure that you're looking um, for, for funding and scholarship opportunities, especially from those, those people who direct those programs. And you may um, be really fortunate to get a lot of money to do that. I'm going to chime in real quick and give a plug. Now, I don't have the opportunity for students to go abroad, but myself and uh, one of my one of my workers, Robert Brewer, who works in Tennessee, we started a program called the Student Wildlands Adventure Program. And it's meant for undergraduate college students who are still trying to figure out where they want to go. But what we do instead of going abroad, we'll take wildlife students from the West and we'll take them to the Appalachian Mountains. And then the following year, we'll take students from the East and bring them out West so they learn about the different ecosystems. And guess what, guys? We pay everything. The students don't pay a dime. We just want those students to get an, an experience that will hopefully change their life. So keep an eye out for that. The New Mexico Wildlife Federation is a fantastic partner, but unfortunately we canceled this year because of COVID, but next year we'll be looking for students again. And just so you know, Eric, um, a bunch of the students that we've taken have come from New Mexico Highlands University. I literally am writing this down and I may email you later. <laughs> okay. No problem. I, I took three or four of them from, from Highlands to Tennessee a couple of years ago. Daryl, I'm pretty sure I should go on the next one. I mean, <laughs> we need kind of what I need to do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, any other questions, guys? Doesn't look like it. So we're going to say a big thank you to Eric. Thank you, Eric, for spending time with us this morning and sharing all of your really awesome experiences. And they're surely motivating and hopefully the kids um, and adults alike on this call uh, got some inspiration from you. And also Daryl, uh, both of you, I think uh, it was a great way to start this event. Um, don't forget guys that we will be here the, for the rest of the week, every morning from nine to 10 a.m. Everyone's welcome back every single day to come and learn about some of the other cool jobs that we have here in New Mexico and across the country in conservation, so. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank Bye you. Guys. Thank you. Bye.